Today on the Laura Flanders Show, pirates were some of the first people in the world to create democratic constitutions. Alexa Clay, co-founder of the League of Entrepreneurs and the director of the Human Agency Collective. If someone else is not doing well, that's going to affect me. So obviously, I do want to help them. And later, guest host Pamela Brown is stepping in for me for a bit. But I'll be back with a few words on the most critical labor lawsuit in years. Think you've nothing to learn from pirates and hustlers? Our next guest urges you to think again. When it comes to creative innovation, pirates, gangsters, and hackers may have as much to teach as the Steve Jobs and Richard Bransons of the world. Successful misfits, in fact, may be the best matched to make it in today's askew economy. At least that's the case made by Alexa Clay in her book co-written with Kyra Maya Phillips, The Misfit Economy. Clay's co-founder of the League of Entrepreneurs and the director of the Human Agency Collective, about which more later. Alexa, welcome to the program. Great, thanks for having Do me. Do I have your co-author's name right? Yep. All right, The Misfit Economy. I read this. Yeah. <laughs> you really want me to believe that an Amish camel milker will save us from this sick and stagnant <laughs> economy that we've come to know and hate? Have you tasted camel milk? <laughs> well, no, it's true, I have not. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I spent a lot of time traveling the world, speaking to misfits, going into different subcultures, and one that I just found mind-blowing was the Amish. And really, I think at a time when so much of entrepreneurship is controlled by this Silicon Valley narrative, for me, it was really refreshing to find this return to basics, this idea that entrepreneurship doesn't have to invoke this kind of lone cowboys type of myth, but well, can be done collaboratively. Although, Return to Basics doesn't immediately summon up camel milking. <laughs> no, no. In that way, it's pretty <laughs> offbeat, and I would say innovative. Um, and it's it's gray market, you know? It's a commodity that um, has been really illegal in many parts of the US, and Amish camel milk farmers have really fought around some of that legislation. Now, you can buy it in California, in Whole Foods, for example, and the way they got around some of that legislation was by selling it through buyer's clubs, which is how HIV and AIDS medications used to be sold in the 80s when there were also issues of legality. Now, the other people you're very keen on are um, pirates. Yeah. Tell us why. Well, it started with looking at historic pirate cultures. Um, so really going back and understanding that pirates were some of the first people in the world to create democratic constitutions. So before Western European countries had democracies, pirates were creating egalitarian contracts for really governing their vessels. And there were a lot of misfit subcultures that we looked at that have this streak of egalitarianism, hacker collectives, for example, that operate with without bosses, without traditional senses of leadership, where their organizations are much more decentralized. And, you know, for me, we're in this we're in this moment where we're trying to escape a very command and control mm -hmm. type of capitalism that we've inherited through the legacy of the Industrial Revolution. And so looking elsewhere, looking to the fringes, looking at some of these alternative ways of structuring economic activity in organizations, I think we can learn a lot. From well, it's them. interesting that you would say that because you do describe uh, so the sort of misfit culture as comparable perhaps to those loosely structured guilds of yeah. the kind of craft economy age before yeah. industrial capitalism. What changed with industrial capitalism and was it inevitable that it turned <laughs> out this way? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it was necessarily inevitable. I think um, what intrigued me about certain moments in the industrial revolution is you actually did see instincts of collaboration that just didn't fit the reporting mechanism of neoliberal economics. What do you mean? So, for example, um, R&D IP. There's this whole narrative that, you know, companies should have proprietary access to intellectual property. Mm -hmm. But during the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, it was actually IP thieves, pirates, who took these patents from Western Europe, brought them to America, and laid the entire groundwork for the Industrial Revolution. And, I, mean, and I did think when I thought you saw your pirate chapter, I thought, well, what would be the relevance today? Here were people who were trying to protect their own fishing waters from encroachment by foreign trawlers. Could we take hostage, I don't know, big box stores as they drive onto Main Street to take away our, our, our custom? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's emboldening, right? I think a lot of the activities that we look at within the misfit economy are about provoking systems that need to be shaken yeah. up, that need to be changed. And so activism is certainly one angle there. Um, but I think you also see a lot of different types of activities. So one of the identities that I've been working a lot with is the notion of the insider misfit, the entrepreneur, the person within these huge companies, within government, within large NGOs, who is bringing their full self into the workplace, who is bringing all a, a huge societal agenda into the workplace, who's actively trying to hack the cultures of the institutions they're a part of. And to me, that's a completely different remit than a kind of lean-in business philosophy mm -hmm. that suggests that you just conform to this job mm -hmm. description, you pursue an idea of success that's not your own. Um, and that, I think, is a powerful movement. You talk about another man, I'd love you to just share the story, Antonio Fernandez, yeah. who tried to kind of re not, not just rebrand, really transform um, the Latin Kings organization in New York. Explain what happened to him. It was a huge vision, not so yeah. successful. Yeah, and I think that was the challenge. Was it just a sort of rebranding marketing ploy, a sort of greenwashing and of a gang? remind what the Latin Kings were. So the Latin Kings is a, a Hispanic street gang, originated in Chicago, um, but has global influence. You know, there are Latin Kings in Sweden even. Uh, he gave a talk there and was surprised to meet some. Uh, but Antonio Fernandez essentially was the CEO of the Latin Kings during um, a period when it was recovering from uh, a really deadly sort of reputational identity and a lot of sort of internal violence that was happening. Uh, and his mission was, you know, which is in his name, Tone, was really around restoring the tone of the gang. How could this gang pivot and become a social movement? How could uh, you take underground organizations and turn them into political movements and political communities. And so that was part of what he tried to do. He really brought in a lot of um, activists to upskill gang members in different elements of protest. Uh, he launched curriculum, so you know they would be reading books together. There's a whole philosophy of kingism that is uh, almost like a self-help mm -hmm. kind of philosophy in a lot of ways. And he was one of the first people that I spoke to who completely got me thinking about gangs in a different mm -hmm. way. One concern I had reading some of this was that it could be seen as a kind of libertarian, just deregulate and individual entrepreneurs and yeah, yeah. Ayn Randian <laughs> brave people will uh, solve our problems. Is there a danger here that you kind of end up with a, I don't know, survival of the, mis the misfittest? <laughs> I think you're right to call attention to that narrative. I think um, it, in a way it's a Trojan horse narrative um, for me is there's so many social justice and economic issues that I care deeply about. And yet the issues, a lot of the issues that we talk about in the book, there's maybe a voyeurism that comes with learning about pirates, learning about gangsters. Um, but what makes people interested in those issues? And to me, it's seeing, you know, this libertarian ethos around hustling as something that also exists in the black market. Mm -hmm. And so I very much see my role not as one of objective scholarship, if you will, but really of what are the narrative bridges that we can use to get communities talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So at our launch event, for example, we had former drug kingpins there, members of the Latin Kings. We also had startup founders mm -hmm. and a lot of people that would ascribe to this kind of Ayn Rand vision. Um, and they were interacting, maybe awkwardly at times, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was, I think it was beautiful. And I think when you look at the immense privilege of all these tech incubators and startup hubs mm -hmm. around the world, and just the amount of wealth that the venture capital community has, how can we take some of that? And how can we, you know, give access to communities that have been marginalized mm -hmm. from that economic opportunity? And change the sort of um, profile of who deserves respect. Yeah. You end the book by visualizing your kind of pro-misfit culture, um, the culture where people's, I think you call it positive deviance, mm. is unlocked. Uh, you also urge us all to learn how to unlock our, our inner hacker or personal private uh, pirate. Uh, how? What, what, what's, <laughs> what are your top five tips or something? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think so often we wear a sort of script or persona professionally. Um, and so part of the misfit revolution that I would see 
is people, you know, unmasking. I think bringing, when you bring your full humanity into what you do, I think you'll come to see conflicts. I was at an advertising conference on Monday and it was amazing to see people taking off these masks and saying, you know, actually these are some issues I really care about and being really critical about mm -hmm. their the institutions they are working for. And I hope that that kind of restlessness, that sort of frustration, um, you know, that there are pathways for people to have enhanced agency. And very concretely, some of the tools that we look at are around the principles of hustling, which we mentioned, copying, which is around really doing things much more collaboratively with uh, less of a premium on, premium on ownership. Uh, we look at cultures of hacking, which is beyond just you know hacking and penetrating sort of computer systems, but this idea of culture change. Mm -hmm. and. We're all born into cultures that we didn't ask to be born into. So how do we transform those cultures? How do we appreciate what's there and that sort of historic legacy while at the same time bringing either a revolutionary or reformist agenda into mm -hmm. that? Uh, we look at the spirit of provocation. So people that are really good at creating alternative realities in different types of worlds, protest movements, uh, French feminist collectives, uh, and just some of those different tactics. Mm. And then the last thing we, we looked at was this idea of pivoting, which is not just pivoting an organization or changing focus, but so many of the misfits that I interviewed had these stories of going down these crazy rabbit holes, you know, of sort of unplugging from the system and really following an instinct or a passion. And that was really the key for them to unlock mm. a completely different way of being in the economy. It's great talking to you. Thank you so much, Alexa Clay, and thanks for the book, The Misfit Economy. Um, you can get more information and learn your own lessons in creativity from pirates by getting a copy of the book through our website. Thanks for coming in, Alexa. Thanks for having me. My name is Pam Brown, and I'm sitting in today for Laura Flanders. I'm here with Mickey Metz and Janelle Orsi. Mickey is a Drupal hacker, activist and industry organizer. She's a member of Agaric, a worker-owned cooperative of web developers that builds platforms and applications using free software. Janelle is a lawyer, advocate, writer, and cartoonist focused on cooperatives, the sharing economy, and community-supported enterprises. She is co-founder and executive director of the Sustainable Economies Law Center, which facilitates the growth of more sustainable and localized economies through education, research, and advocacy. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. So Mickey, I want to start with you. Okay. Um, can you describe Agaric? It's a worker-owned cooperative of developers. What is that and why did you start it? Well, um, Agaric was started by uh, one of my partners back in 2006 um, as a way to do cooperative development and to have a way to create surplus to be able to use that surplus to build tools for people to cooperate and build things that they could start companies on without a huge investment and with some support, a community of support. So you're saying that the software itself that you're using also allows more access to, uh, to different companies? Well, we build stuff with free software. Um, we also work with the Free Software Foundation, which is in Boston. And to use free software means it's not free as in beer. It's free as in liberty. It protects your privacy, your liberty. You are free to share the code, change the code, modify it, sell it, distribute it, whatever. But you have full access to the source code of your whatever your business is running on. Janelle, and you've started something called the Sustainable Economies Law Center. What motivated you to, mm -hmm. to start that? And what is it exactly? Yeah, well, so Sustainable Economies Law Center, our mission is to help communities create their own sources of land, food, housing, jobs, energy, and, and other basic necessities, which lately has been including software, realizing so much of our lives now depend on software. Um, and my, my focus as a lawyer for the last eight years has been helping people share. So helping communities come together, harness the resources they have and share them. But as I started to do that, I realized there are so many legal barriers. One of the biggest barriers is just lawyers aren't out there to help people do that. Mm. A lot of lawyers are focused on helping people earn lots of money through big companies. And so 
getting mm. the legal help you need. That's one barrier. Um, but another barrier is just that there are actually a lot of laws that keep people from coming together and sharing resources because these laws are designed to protect people from each other. So mm. Sustainable Economies Law Center, um, we do policy advocacy to change those laws. We do legal education. We provide direct legal services. We do a lot of legal research to basically create a new legal landscape where people can co-own the resources they need. Can you give us just one example? What is a, what's an example of a law that prevents people from being able to share? Ah, um, well, I always like to use the example of food cooperatives. Um, and I, I know here in New York, there's a big food cooperative called Park Slope. Um, but elsewhere in the country, people have started to let, form cooperatives. Let's say 400 people come together and they're using someone's garage to bring in a bunch of food and basically share it with each other and get food at lower costs. They could be violating health and safety laws because you can't use a garage for something like that. They could be violating employment laws if they all agree they're each gonna say volunteer three hours a month because uh, we have employment laws to prevent people from giving away their labor. Um, if they put in their money to help start it, they could be violating securities laws, which are designed to protect them mm. from lo losing their money and in investment schemes. They could be violating zoning laws. That's, that's four examples for one cooperative. What mm. kinds of laws would we really need if we wanted to foster a more of a mm. sharing kind of an economy yeah. where people are able to come together to you share uh, share ways to get food in their community, share mm -hmm. ways to be healthy in their mm -hmm. community, whatever it might be. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot that governments can do to lower barriers, create incentives to these kinds of activities. And so, for example, in the example of a worker cooperative, if you go to a small business development center and say you want to form a worker cooperative, usually, yes. even though they're government funded, they don't have that kind of knowledge around cooperatives. Even though cooperatives they're, they are a legal concept that we've had around for a very long time, and mm -hmm. they, they grew especially during the Depression, and so there are a lot of co-ops out there, but there's just not a lot of encouragement to form them. Um, it's very difficult to get financing for them because you're not going to venture capitalists and asking to get financing, and so there's a, I think that's a huge role uh, that the government can play is creating financing opportunities. And then overall, I, I think because a cooperative keeps wealth local, and for example, a city like New York really benefits from having worker cooperatives and from those cooperatives keeping the wealth local. I think New York, for example, should, and New York has been doing this, by the way, <laughs> prioritize cooperative development and put funding toward it um, to sort of grease the wheels of that movement. We yeah. saw Occupy Wall Street here in New York. Mm -hmm. is a deep critique of inequality. We see Black Lives Matter happening. I'm just curious, how, yeah. how in this concept of cooperatives, is it thought of, or maybe it's a debate that's happening, yeah. but how are people understanding the ways in which um, cooperatives and keeping wealth local yeah. could foster and continue to contribute to some of those problems as yeah. well as break them down? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm glad you mm. asked it because for a while that idea of keeping wealth local didn't speak to me because I thought people need wealth elsewhere um, as well. But then I realized it's not so much that it, the money is leaving our communities and going elsewhere, it's almost always going to people who already have money because of the, the structure of most businesses is such that the people who put in the capital are the ones who get the profits. And so cooperatives basically switch that around um, and distribute the profits back to the people who are participating. So it's a structure, rather than creating a structure um, where money buys profits and money buys power, Cooperatives are structures where people hold the power and people hold the profits. And that can actually s change the flow of wealth in society because we have such incredible wealth inequality right now and it's getting worse. And so it basically tells us we need to change the rules of this whole game and turn things around and bring that wealth backwards and I think back to us. And I mm -hmm. think that's what cooperatives do. Mm -hmm. Mickey, yes. um, in your experience working day to day on the ground in your cooperative, do you feel that as a worker working within that structure that you do more work, that you do less work? How does work change for you as a, just being, a part, being an owner, being a co-owner of a business? And also, by the way, being a part of a larger network as well. Well, that's the wonderful thing about it. I don't work. <laughs> I don't do a lick of work. <laughs> I do what I love to do. And um, 
I don't really, I've never separated my life from my work unless I've, when I was working for large corporations and in a cube, yes. I had to separate my life from my work, but I found that you really don't need to do that and it's kind of a dangerous thing to do when you're not invested in what you're doing during your waking hours. Um, I've seen it devastate people emotionally, financially, and you know, in their families. They're taking themselves out of their family all the time. Um, I'm able to work when I wish to work or work on what I wish to work on. And it's, I feel it's a cooperative effort because the other people in Agaric are always there to help me. I don't, um, when I worked in a cube, if I came across an issue, I would have to like, ooh, I better go to my boss or figure this out or I better go home you know, mm -hmm. or something. But now, it's, if I run up against a challenge, I have a whole network of people to just say, help me with this. And people will put down what they're doing, help right then. And it's more of a family-oriented work structure, I guess you mm -hmm. would see it, because if someone else is not doing well, that's going to affect me. So obviously, I do want to help them. Janelle, we have just a few minutes mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious. This is such an interesting comment that, um, that Mickey is making. She's saying mm -hmm. that she feels so much better about her work, and she's doing it a lot of the time, let's say. Yeah. Part of the worker struggles over the last century and a half were to reduce hours, to compartmentalize work. So how within thinking about a new economy, a new, mm. more sustainable uh, future for all of us, do you think institutions would play a role and legal change would play a role? Mm. Wow, big question. Mm. <laughs> you know, I think so long as we're operating within this very conventional legal framework, we need to continue to pass laws that give workers more rights and give workers more pay. At the same time that we're doing everything possible to get out of that ex exploitative structure, the conventional businesses just have an incentive to squeeze as much out of workers as they possibly can. But when workers have control of their day and they, they own the means of production, they can make a lot of choices about what their work life is like and what they're doing and what their career path is and what the path of their business is. And I think that alone will bring a lot of change. I don't consider it work, I consider it creating value. I'm not creating work, piles of work, creating piles of value. Mickey, Janelle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. That was Pamela Brown. Thanks, Pam. The Supreme Court is considering the most important labor case in years. Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association ostensibly addresses public workers' rights on the job, specifically their right not to have to support their union. The plaintiffs argue that the sum they pay to the union that represents them violates their free speech and free association rights horror. In their view, they shouldn't have to give money to a union whose political actions they oppose, even if there's already a process for opting out of those activities. It's all about freedom, they say. Many have pointed out now that free speech in this case is a cover for an attack on collective bargaining. The idea that people together can do what they can't individually. The ramifications of all those lost contributions on public workers' unions and public workers should be obvious. But if the justices really want to talk about freedom in the workplace, let's go there. Most workers have no freedom when it comes to hours or wages or working conditions. Many are told what to wear, what to do, and even when they can go to the bathroom. In a capitalist system, you could say individuals are free to take a job or quit it, but in a work-or-die economy, there's not much free choice involved in that. If you want real democracy in the workplace, Supreme Court justices, we can build that, as we hear from the people on this program who are involved in worker-owned enterprises and cooperatives where every worker has a say. But if you want real democracy in the workplace, you have to democratize ownership. Friedrichs is a Trojan horse attack on unions and collective bargaining, for sure. But a real national conversation about freedom in the workplace? We could go there. A whole lot of people working for a new and different economy would say, bring it on. To tell me what you think, write to laura at lauraflanders.com.
and thanks. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smart, not sound bites. Every week, right here. Subscribe and thanks. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, poetry and trans politics with the performance group Dark Matter. Trans women and trans feminine people have been doing feminist organizing forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that actually colonization on this land was about trans misogyny. Actually, Stonewall was about trans women and trans feminine people of color resisting police violence. Mm -hmm. This week on the show, change within the system or changing the system? Activist entrepreneur Judy Wicks talks about her work to make business more human. We need to measure our success by uh, the well-being of our communities and the well-being of our natural world. While movement theorist Gopal Dianini explores how capitalism itself works. At some point, people are like, no, you cannot do that to me and to my community in my home. 